Today we're going to talk about surface integrals. So it'll be outlined kind of like this. We'll do a brief introduction. Then we need to learn a little bit about how to parameterize surfaces. We'll introduce the surface area differential, which leads nicely to a surface area calculation. Um, and then we'll, for the rest of it, we'll talk about actually what a surface integral is and how to compute them. So as an introduction, they're kind of similar to line integrals. Our goal is always going to be to integrate a function. And as you saw, we saw with line integrals, our choices for fun types of functions we can integrate are scalar functions or vector fields. Um, and, but as for any integral, we have to integrate over uh, what I like to call the domain of integration. And so in the case of line integrals, our domain of integration was a curve in space or the plane. Whereas before, up until before line integrals, we were always integrating over a region in the in the plane or, or a, a solid region in space. Um, now for surface integrals, this time we want to inter, integrate over a surface in space or region in the plane. So not an entire like a solid in space, like a ball, including the center, but rather just some kind of quote unquote flat surface in the plane that can be curvy, if you will. All right, so we learned how to parameterize curves using vector valued functions. So we used R of T and the X, Y, and Z component functions um, output as a vector. And there's always some interval of domain interval of the parameter T input. And we kind of thought of that as uh, for each input T, you can think of it as a time, it outputs a position vector for each point along the curve in space. So we're going to do something similar with surfaces. However, in this in this instance, instead of having just one input that we think of as time t, now our inputs are going to be points uv, um, and that's the common notation. And so now our x, y, and z component functions are going to be in terms of two parameters rather than just one. So here's a quick note. Perhaps it's unnecessary, but I learned this instead of the r notation, like boldface R for vector valued function. I learned it with like a capital V there. Um, and the reason that is, is kind of to avoid polar coordinate confusion because we use R and theta. All that said, I'm going to stick with the textbooks. Both of our textbooks use the R notation. Um, and it just illustrates the importance of making sure that when you're handwriting something, you, uh, you note whether it's a vector or whether it's a scalar value like polar coordinates. All right, and that's what this next slide page is about, really. It could be a little seen as a little bit confusing if you use R as your uh, position function parametrization, uh, vector valued function name, as well as a variable value. But just make sure you label it with a vector on top and it'll work out. Or if you prefer, you can go ahead and use the other uh, notation. And Math Insight uh, uses that as well. That's how I learned it. Anyway, I like, like I said, you choose. All right, so let's talk about parametric surfaces. So again, like we said in the introduction, we're not limiting ourselves to just curves in space. Now we're going to allow ourselves to work with surfaces in space. So the surface area differential for a parametrized surface, um, and thought I was being funny here, I put move over the area on the volume differential. It's time for the surface area differential. Anyway, uh, ds is going to be given by um, the cross product of, of the two tangent vectors to our surface at a point, r sub u and r sub v, uh, the two partial derivatives there. And then you get to get, take magnitude of that cross product, and that'll relate your differentials. More notations, you could write the same thing using partials, and since it's, that can be seen as, as well. All right, so here's one piece of caution. Uh, it's common to use the calligraphic S to represent the surface as the domain of integration for a surface integral, and then a capital S when referring to the surface area differential. Both of our texts do this, Apex and OpenStax. However, in other texts and other places, you may see the use of sigma for the surface area differential as well. Okay, so some definitions before we actually learn how to parameterize stuff. Uh, Points on a surface can be represented by a position vector with component functions that take in two parameters, as we saw. Um, and then u and v are going to belong to some domain r in the uv plane. So vocabulary here, parameters always refer to the inputs of your parameterization 
function, the R function. And those parameters are generically U and V. It's common to use them as um, polar coordinates and literally see an example where I just go ahead and use X and Y. But the parameter domain is, I like to refer to it with R. So we'll, R is a region in the UV plane. It's, it's not the projection of anything. It is the domain of our parameters. Uh, and then the surface, that's the resulting range, the output of the parameterization above. So I'm not gonna click these, but I really strongly encourage you to have a look at them. Um, Math Insight has some really nice interactive uh, plots that kind of help solidify a lot of these concepts. So grid curves are the idea of holding one parameter fixed. We can examine the curve traced out on the surface by the other parameter, and we call this a grid curve. And so I said I wasn't gonna click them, but let's take a quick look at one of those. All right, so looking at a grid curve here, well, if we select this, the uh, little interactive thing lets us do that. And you can see that if you fixed U in that particular value, then let's see, am I gonna be able to do this? No, I'm not. The tablet's gonna prevent me. Again, I really encourage you to look at this because it's really kind of very, very nice outputs. But you can select grid curves and move around the point in the UV plane, that, that uh, domain of the parameter plane and see the corresponding point in on the surface that it represents. And then there's another one down here, which kind of corresponds in regions. You can select regions and play around with that too. Okay, back to the lecture. All right, so let's do an example here first to start. We're just gonna take a look at an example. We say, hey, I've got this cone in space and I would like to parameterize it. In other words, my goal is to write out some, some vector valued function that takes in two inputs and gives me a position vector to a point on that surface. Um, I didn't plot it very well. I just kind of plotted the general cone and then the intersection of that cone with the z equals one plane. So we're just interested in the lower portion of that cone from the origin, the purple cone up to the z equals one plane, if you will. Not the uh, blue plane, just points on that purple cone surface, not the interior. So it's very circular looking has some symmetry around the domain or a symmetry around the, the Z axis. I think cylindrical coordinates might be a good way to go for this. So let's just give them a shot. Cylindrical coordinates um, give us three variables though, because X is equal to R cosine of theta and Y is equal to R sine of theta, but then Z is its own variable, right? That does, so we, we, our goal is we need two parameters, not three. So we're gonna have to figure something out for Z. That works pretty well for r cosine of theta, r sine of theta. Um, well, to make that work, thinking about over here in the plane at the z equals one intersection, what are we gonna have there? We're gonna have one is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Well, that square root doesn't really do anything. We square both sides and we got ourselves the unit circle. So it looks like, I think we're gonna end up with r is gonna vary between zero and one. And theta, as usual, we're just gonna let it run wild and vary between zero and two pi. Okay, so now let's let's look at our z problem. Z is equal to what? Well, z is equal to, let's just write it out and see what we can do. See what happens when we try and turn this into cylindrical coordinates. Well, that is convenient because x squared plus y squared is, is r squared. And that gives us that z is the same thing as r. So our problem solved itself for this example. Um, so since Z is the same thing as R, for that Z component function, we can replace it with R and then we'll have done it. Let's try it, let's see what we've got. So we've got our parameterization of the surface, our two parameters are R and theta, and the X component function is R cosine of theta in the X direction plus R sine of theta in the Y direction plus, well, Z is equal to R, R in the Z direction, and sure enough, that is a uh, parameterization, which only relies on two variables. And we already talked about the domain of our parameters, which will become important. Okay, let's see another example. So for this example, we're gonna do a cylinder this time. And we've got X squared plus Y minus three squared, the quantity squared equals nine. And we wanna do that cylinder between zero and five in the Z plan. So what's this gonna be? Oh, I don't know. Um, this may not be the best sketch, but it won't hurt anything to have a little sketch here. Maybe it will, maybe I'll run out of room here. Okay, so that's X, that's Y, 
y minus 3 means it's going to be over here at 1, 2, 3. It's going to be there and have a, 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 a radius of 3. So if I were to plot this thing in the plane, it would look something like that. And then we're going to let this thing extend up to z is equal to 5. So this is our surface, kind of a hollow cylinder, if you will. Um, and to do a little bit better, I'll, I'll make this there, and then we'll make that would be behind our front surface. So this kind of hollow cylinder, that's our surface. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of at a loss of what to do with this one, so we're just gonna attack it and see what happens. So I'm just gonna expand that out. X squared, plus, well, let's go over here for more room. X squared plus Y squared minus six Y plus nine is equal to nine. Well, the plus nine and equal to nine uh, would subtract it over, get zero, and tidies it up a little bit. Um, Again, this thing smells of something that might be okay in cylindrical coordinate. It doesn't have the symmetry around the z-axis we like, but I do see um, x squared plus y squared, which we can turn into r squared, and then y would could just be six r cos or r sine of theta. And then there's there's no z here, so I guess z could just run wild. But let's see what happens here. We still we still got a problem because we've got r and theta, there's two variables, and then we still have to let z vary between zero and five. Um, so I don't know, let's just keep going down this road. We'll solve for r, see what happens. Six r sine of theta. Well, that's nice, we got r on both sides, so we could uh, multiply by one over r, or divide by r if you prefer, and uh, tidy that up to r is equal to six sine of theta. Okay. Well, let's try it. Let's just see what happens because I don't have any better ideas here. So X is equal to R cosine of theta and Y, oh, well, we'll just deal with X first. Well, what 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 do we have to work with? We have this fact, oh, that, that marker was bigger than necessary. All right, so that's the more reasonable size marker, but okay, so we know that R is equal to six sine of theta. Well, by kind of cleverly substituting in for r down here, what are we going to get? Let's just see what happens. X is equal to, well, six, r is going to be replaced with 6 sine of theta, cosine of theta. Well, that's not so bad because x is in now in terms of only one variable, theta. And I bet you the same thing is going to happen if we uh, address y. Y is equal to r sine of theta. And again, we will replace r with 6 sine of theta times the sine of theta that was already there. We'll highlight that to kind of illustrate what we just did. And that tidies up to six y squared theta. And again, y is now in terms of one variable. And that's a good thing because we do need the, I don't see anywhere we're gonna get the z, the z variable here, except for just kind of letting it be itself saying, hey, z is gonna be our second parameter in this uh, parameterization. And apologies, I'll probably mispronounce all of the words. And there's a good chance I misspell parameter and parameterization because the system I use to type up these doesn't recognize those as words. Anyway, back to the task at hand. We've got our parameterization. I have X depends on one variable, Y depends on where one variable, and Z depends on a different variable. So we've only got two input variables. So in this case, our two input variables are gonna be theta and Z, and our X component is gonna be six, sine of theta, cosine of theta. The y component is going to be six sine squared of theta. And the z component is just going to be z. And that will parameterize that nicely. <laughs> For every input value in our domain of the parameters, well, we haven't talked about that yet, but we will next. It'll output a vector to a position, to a point, a position vector on that surface. So what do we need to let our parameters vary for. So our domain of our parameterization, since I used capital R, we'll use capital R to represent the domain of our parameterization. And so theta, well, in this parameterization, we're going to let theta vary. And it turns out letting it vary between uh, zero and pi will be good enough to generate this in whole, everything we need, and then letting z vary between five and zero will give us the cylinder. When z is zero, our grid curve that's traced out would just be that circle in the plane. And then at every height of z, we'd trace out a copy of that circle above uh, the original one, quote unquote above. 
other common parameterizations that you might run into. Um, if you have a sphere of radius A, well, basically that's, uh, those are sol spherical coordinates. We've just replaced rho with A. And since A is a fixed value and we're only interested on points that are on the surface of the sphere, rho is not gonna vary because we don't need the interior of it now. So that, that A value can be a fixed value. I used A rather than R radius because we've got enough Rs floating around in here. So then we could just use spherical coordinates with phi and theta as usual to generate a parameterization for our sphere. Uh, here's one, similar to kind of what we just did, but slightly different um, for any vertical prism. Uh, so think of it this way, any situation where you have only two variables present in the original equation. So think that you could solve for y and get it all in terms of x, and then you get some kind of an equation strictly in the xy plane. And what you want to do is you want to extend that out and straight up in the vertical direction, a vertical prism, if you will, just like the cylinder. Plot that circle in the plane and extend it straight vertically above it. Well, then if you can solve easily for y, um, sometimes the integrals that result from this are going to be better in polar or spherical, but whatever. Uh, you can parameterize it like this as letting x be your input, one of your inputs, and then z being the other, similar to what we just did. And then it sort of naturally comes that well, x is your input there, but then y is going to be f of x, whatever function of x you solve for y, and then z. And lastly, for another common surface parameterization, if you have something of the form z is equal to f x y, well, that's going to be a surface in space. Uh, let's think of it as kind of a surface floating around somewhere above a, a domain of integral or uh, above its domain. Well, then you can choose X and Y to be your variables, uh, your parameters rather for parameterization. And they'll just be the X and the Y components. And then above it, in that Z component, you'll just have the Z equals F of X, Y. And this should be domain restrictions of X and Y, not X and Z. Okay, in the coming sections, we'll often need to be able to parameterize a surface and know the domain on which it is parameterized, that UV domain. So that'll be important. So this is kind of just a really quick picture stolen from Math Insight. Um, the surface you parameterize has a domain on the left in green, the UV plane that uh, is used to parameterize this surface in space. It's not actually the projection of the surface down onto the xy plane, but rather it's it's a kind of its own whole domain thing in different variables. So this brings us to uh, the surface. We're now kind of ready to talk about the surface dif area differential. So before we just recklessly introduce it, let's talk about tangent vectors to a surface. Remember that if we have a smooth surface and if we parameterize it, as we're, we're learning to do, R of UV is X and Y and Z components are all in terms of U and V. The surface is smooth if the partial derivatives of our parameterization, R of U and R of V are continuous and the cross product of them is never zero on the interior of our parameters domain. All that's to say, it's a nice smooth surface. Then because the cross product of them on a small, a smooth surface will never be zero, Think of what it means. What does one of the interpretations of the cross product was the area of a parallelogram uh, defined by those two vectors? Whoops, I should have emphasized that because that's what I was talking about. Okay, so little pieces of area, if you have like a surface, and this isn't gonna be a very good picture, but if you have some kind of a surface floating around here in space, this is all gonna go away when I move the slide and that's kind of okay. So you got yourself a point and then you've got R sub U and then R sub V. So the partials of your parameterization with respect to your two parameters. Then that, the cross product of these gives us the area of this nice little parallelogram there. And if you kind of shrink that down really, really small and do that at every single point on that surface, you end up with and like a summing all those up, you got yourself the area of that surface, which is what the surface area differential is all about. So the surface area differential is given by the cross product of the partials of the, yeah, the cross product of the partials, the magnitude of that, um, and that relates to the differentials. So our surface area, 
um, as we kind of very similar to what we've seen before, we've seen that if you integrate over the region in question, the area differential, you get the area. If you integrate over the region in space in question, you get the volume, surface and interior included, the volume of that solid in space, if you will. Um, and the same idea extends to the surface area differential as well. So the area of a surface, the area of, notice that little cali calligraphic S representing the surface, whereas capital S represents the surface area differential. So the area of a surface is the integral of the surface area differential over that surface itself as the domain of integration. The surface needs to be smooth. And if you have your um, domain of your parameters is a less than u less than b and c less than v less than d, then you can write this all out and replacing this with this, our integral becomes something that we can totally do at this point. So with that in mind, let's do another example. All right, so this is the same example that we parameterized earlier. So let's go ahead and borrow some earlier work that we had. We parameterized this thing as um, r with parameters r and theta. And this was given by the x component function r cosine of theta, the y component function r sine of theta, and then the z component function of just r. So what calculations do we need? Well, I see that I'm gonna need the partials. So let's do the partials here. Uh, the partial of r with respect to u is cosine of theta, sine of theta one. The partial of r with respect to v is negative r sine of theta, r cosine of theta and zero. And then I'm going to omit the calculation in the interest of time, but everybody here knows how to take a cross product. The cross product of these is going to be r times the square root of two. And so putting all of that together, we can now, oh wait, I'm sorry. That's not true. That was the magnitude. Go look more carefully at my, my notes. The actual cross product of those two vectors that we just calculated, the partial vectors, is negative r cosine of theta, r negative r sine of theta, and r in the z. The magnitude of that jazz, oh, I see something. I'm going to pause and fix what I did wrong. I was referring to this as r with the partial with respect to u and the partial with respect to v. Since r, u, and rv are thetas there, I didn't, I didn't do it below. So the cross product of our partials is gonna be the partial with respect to r crossed with the partial with respect to theta and it is that vector there. And then the magnitude of the cross product is uh, going to end up being uh, r times the square root of two. Putting that all together into our area integral, the area of our surface s is gonna be the double integral over that so our parameters here i didn't write down the write down the domain of parameters but we can just re refer and recall back to that parameterization we let theta vary from zero to two pi and we let r vary from zero to one and then we're going to integrate the magnitude of the cross product of the partials that's going to be r root two and d r d theta one quick word of caution here. You don't need to include the R that comes with the usual polar area differential because we're not substituting in or, or dealing with an area differential. Um, remember, we've seen this before. DA is equal to R if, if DA is DX, DY, and we convert to polar, it's R, DR, D theta. We've seen that a lot. But we're not doing that here. And just it's common to kind of want to do that as you're writing down dr, d theta. Oh, yeah, I got to include the r. Nope. We've already dealt with that because our differential has already been related and calculated. Okay. So, relatively straightforward integral. I'll leave it to people to work it and verify that this is the truth. But integrate that out, and you'll see that we get um, pi root two as the surface area of the lower portion of the cone shown in the picture. So doing a, the surface area of a scalar function is very, very similar to 
that. We just need to evaluate the scalar function in terms of our parameter. So just like we learned to integrate functions, uh, scalar function little f or vector field capital F over a curve as the domain of integration for line integrals, we're going to learn to integrate functions, again, scalar or vector fields over a surface as the domain of integrations with surface integrals. You can kind of think of this intuitively as points on the surface we are integrating over as the inputs for the function that we're actually integrating. It's a nice intuitive way to think about that. So here's the formula, if you will, uh, for a surface area of a scalar function, little f. Um, our surface calligraphic f's is parameterized by boldface r, and it is has that boldface r parameterization exists on a parameterization domain of capital R. Whew, I should just say read this. All right. So the only difference that we we know that we know that this is just this, right? That's just the surface area differential. And so all we have to do is evaluate our given scalar function in terms of our parameterization. And we've done that before for line integrals over scalar functions with, uh, yeah, line integrals over scalar functions of scalar functions. We just now have more inputs going on for our parameterization. So here's kind of a general method to attack this process. I like to do it this way. Um, if we're given a scalar continuous scalar function, little f, and we want to integrate it over a surface s, um, See, I slipped up and used capital S instead of calligraphic S for the surface. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to parameterize the domain of integration. So that means parameterize our surface. Um, and so we're going to use R, and it's going to have X and Y and Z component functions in terms of two parameters, which we're just generally going to call U and V. And U and V are going to have their own domain of parameterization. We're going to relate the differentials using the surface area differential. And then we're going to evaluate that function. Um, all this is, is instead of just writing f of boldface r u of v, I kind of plugged in f for the u, x, y, and z component functions that f has, since they're the same thing. OK, let's do another example. So we're going to revisit the example that we've seen before. So we're going to integrate. This time, we're going to integrate the function x squared. Uh, over the cone, our surface, z is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared uh, between 0 and 1. We've already done this parameterization. So step one is kind of done. So let's just go ahead and list it out. So our parameterization is shown there below. We did that in example A. And then for this parameterization, our domain of the parameterization lets r vary from 0 to 1 and theta vary from 0 to 2 pi. The next step we would do is we'd need to relate the differentials. Well. I omitted the calculations here, but I did, uh, we did write all this out when we did the surface area calculation for the cone. So this will look very similar to that. Get our cross product of our partials, and then the magnitude of the cross product of the partials is r root 2. And so to relate the differentials, we have that expression, which we saw in the surface area example. And now we just need to put everything together in terms of the, our, our goal integral. So I like to oftentimes kind of do this before I try to put everything together. So first thing we'll do, we'll evaluate our function in terms of our parameterization. We'll remember that our parameterization was uh, our, whoops, let's get a pen, not a highlighter, r cosine theta, r sine theta, and r. That was bold face r of r comma theta, our parameterization of our surface. And so since, Since our function f is x squared, to evaluate it at our parameterization, we replace x with our cosine of theta. Now we're ready, because we've got all the pieces of the puzzle. We know this piece, we know this piece, we know that piece, and we know that piece too. So we can put it all together. I replace the function, uh, uh, replace our limits of integration, integrate, and you get pi root 2 over 4 for our result. So before we talk about vector functions, or vector fields, we have to talk about orienting a surface. 
Similar to the way that uh, line integrals don't depend on the parameterization, uh, if, you're if you're working with, well, in either case really, but in particular, if you're working with a scalar function, but they do, they don't, again, don't depend on the parameterization, but when you're integrating a vector field, it matters which uh, direction the vector, the uh, closed curve is oriented in. Similar here, we have to, when we're talking surfaces and we're integrating a vector field, we have to have an orientation. Uh, the parameters, the specific parameterization doesn't matter, but the orientation of that uh, parameterization does. So building that, that idea, recall that the cross product of two vectors gives a normal vector to the plane generated by those vectors. Uh, and a unit normal vector to a surface is, well, if you have a parameterization R in terms of U and V, then the partials with respect to U and V are both gonna be tangent to your surface at a point. And so a normal vector will be the cross product of those two vectors. So, and then divide by its magnitude to scale it down to unit length. So when we're talking about orientable surfaces, it's a way of kind of distinguishing the sides. And there's kind of two different ways if you, if you have a surface. If we have a, a regular old surface like that cylinder in space, it had a top and a bottom and kind of an inside and an outside, just depends on how you talk about it. There is a little bit of ambiguity, so we just have to be really clear about what we're talking about here. So, but with that idea, if you calculate one normal vector, then the vector in the opposite direction gives you another normal vector to the surface, N1 and N2 in this photo. So we're gonna choose one side, which we call the positive orientation. If you have a very clear um, interior, say we have a sphere in face as in space, the surface of a sphere in space as our surface, then we have a very clear inside and outside. Everybody would agree that the outside is has a normal pointing in that direction. And then there would be a opposite direction normal inside, which we use dotted lines to show that it's inside the surface. And we consider the outside one to be what we call the positive orientation when you have something that has a very clear inside and outside. When it comes to top and bottom, we really just have to be clear about how we're talking about the problem. So when you see problems, you'll you'll see things like, uh, I want the downward pointing vector to be the orientation, the positive orientation, or the upward pointing vector. Uh, and we just figure out what that means from the context of the problem. So here's a more precise definition of uh, a surface. A surface is orientable if it is possible to define a field of normal vectors to our surface that vary continuously depending on position. And in a way, what that means is, imagine you put a magnet underneath n, n1, ignore n2 for now, because you could choose either one, it doesn't matter. Um, but there's very clearly two sides to the surface. And that surface doesn't have any weird kinks, it's nice and smooth. So that normal vector, if you drag that magnet around underneath that surface, it would vary continuously as you moved it around. It's kind of an intuitive way to think about that. That man, then once you have that criteria met, any surface has two choices for orientation. When we have closed surfaces, like I drew the picture of the sphere on the last slide, we choose the outward pointing normal, uh, outward pointing normal to be the positive orientation. That should probably say normal there outward pointing normal. Uh, and yeah, again, Math Insight has some really, really great interactive applets that kind of help with some of the solidifying of this intuition. But I'll let you explore those on your own. So surface integrals of a vector field. Now we're ready to integrate over a vector field. Integrate over a surface, integrate a vector field. As you can see, I sometimes mix up that vocabulary. All right, the flux, a surface integral of a vector field, capital F is called flux of the vector field of over the oriented surface S as our input, domain of integration. So a surface integral of vector field, capital F, let vector field be a regular old vector field in three space with nice continuous components defined over a smooth surface S having chosen a field of unit normal vectors, capital N, which orient our surface S, then the surface integral of capital F over our surface is given by that, or written out like that, notated as that. Now, fun fact, we don't actually have to calculate a unit length normal vector every time we wanna do a surface integral of a vector field. Um, and this is because, well, a normal vector 
is given by the cross product of the partials normalized. But then the surface differential is given by the magnitude of the partials of the cross product, the cross product of the partials. Since those two values are scalar values, those are just numbers, they just reduce away really nicely. And you're left with a cleaner uh, formula that doesn't actually have to require you to unitize the length of the normal vector always. You just need to find a normal vector pointing in the correct direction of the orientation. One last comment. It switches from S as the surface to R because R is the domain of the parameter. Once you parameterize these things, you have to switch over to R. And those are going to be the values that are going to be the limits of your actual integral. So our last example is going to be to integrate a, do a surface integral of a vector field over a surface. Here's the method for that. It's going to look kind of similar. Step one, find a nice smooth parameterization for your surface. Note the domain of the parameterization because that's going to be the limits of your integration integrals. Uh, step two, we have to orient our surface. So we need to determine which normal vector is going to be appropriate to use uh, related to the orientation. Again, no need to scale it to unit length. You just need to ensure that the normals point in the so-called positive direction, whatever the problem statement tells you to. And then evaluate your parameterized integral. And here I'm mostly just playing with substituting in things and simplifying things. Notice there's a dot product here. So you're going to end up taking the dot product of two vectors. The dot product of two vectors ends up being a scalar function. And so you just use regular uh, integration skills that we've already seen once you've done this math. OK, our example here is going to be we're going to compute the surface integral of the vector field capital F is equal to y squared in the x component, 8 as the y component, and negative x as the z component. We're going to integrate this over the surface, which is the plane x plus y plus z equals 1. And we're only interested in the portion of the plane that's in the first octant. We're going to orient this plane with a downward pointing normal. So in the image below of our surface, this is our surface. This has nothing to do with the field. This is the, the domain of integration, the surface that we're going to be integrating over. Uh, the bit that's below the gray z equals 0 plane, that's just not necessary. We're only interested in the part that's above it. So that's our surface. This right here is s. That's our surface in space. OK, so now we have to parameterize for this surface. Well, this is one of the cases where I can write this thing as z is equal to f of x comma y. And so I can use the parameterization, uh, boldface r is equal to x and y are my input uh, parameters. And then the z component is just f of x, y. So doing that, I get the parameterization. Uh, boldface r relies on inputs parameters, x and y. And the parameterization is the, ve the position vector. x is the x component, y is the y component. And z is equal to 1 minus x minus y for the z component. Oh, no, I didn't resize this very well, for which I apologize. So our domain for the, this parameterization. So now we have to actually consider what are the x and y values that are going to be necessary to make sure that we just get the portion of this plane that we want. And in this case, since we are using x and y, it is the projection of our surface down onto the xy plane. But if you're using different component or uh, different parameterizations, that's not always the case. So. There's a better picture of this on the other slide. So we're going to go ahead and skip ahead and say that I can see here from this. And you could you could do it the other way. You could go with horizontal slices if you wanted to. But I chose to go vertical slices. We're going to let x vary from 0 to 1 right here. And then y is going to vary from 0 here to y is equal to 1 minus x there. Just doing a little bit of algebra to solve for the equation of that line. OK, next thing was step two was to compute our normal vector and address the orientation. So we need to calculate partials to our surface. Uh, so the partial with respect to x is 1, 0, negative 1. The partial with respect to y is 0, 1, negative 1. And it might be informative here and helpful to remember that our parameterization was x, y, 1 minus x minus y. 
and now those partials and their calculations make more sense. Take the cross product of these and you get one, one, one. Note the scale's a little weird on this image. So it looks like it's kind of, well, that's way bigger than a unit vector. Well, it's maybe not, it's not even a unit vector, but the one, one, one vector. And there it is. So, okay, that seems good to go, right? But remember in the problem statement, we were told that we need to orient this thing using the downward pointing normal. So we need to correct this. We have a normal, but it's the wrong direction, the wrong orientation. And so to fix it, we just take the opposite direction of that vector. And so our normal is gonna be negative one, negative one, negative one to be the downward pointing one. I think I just made that long for emphasis or again, the scale is just, well, yeah, no, it doesn't have to be normal. From that point, it's far, it's further away. Okay. All right, the scale of them doesn't totally matter. Next, the last thing to do is we're ready to compute the actual surface integral. So to do that, we need to first calculate a few things. First, we need to evaluate our field in terms of our parameterization. So since X and Y are just what they are, let me write, let me talk this one through just, just a little bit. Let's write R down because that'll help. R, sorry, it's a lot to squeeze onto these slides and that typesetting and it doesn't always allow it to be in here. So we got to squeeze this in here. One minus uh, y, X minus Y. So I'm gonna use, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, so if we're going to parameterize our field F right here in the upper right hand corner, and we're gonna replace variables using our parameterization, well, F, the, the X component of F is Y squared. And so the Y variable in our parameterization is Y. And so we'd substitute Y kind of into itself. It feels a little bit weird, but just pause and think it through and, I'm, and it'll work out. Um, eight is a constant, so that's not impacted by our um, parameterization, but our Z component is X, negative X, and so negative X is going to be negative X. I think a, a way that might be helpful here is to, to note that there's a lack of, there is no, no Z in this parameterization, but if there was Z in the, in the, I'm sorry, there's no Z in our vector field. If there was a Z in the vector field, it would be replaced with one minus X minus Y. And for each instance of Y, X and Y we see in the, in the given field, they're replaced with just X and Y themselves. If you wanted to rewrite this as U and V and one minus U minus V as that, that might be a little uh, perhaps clearer, but I think it kind of muddies the what's actually happening here a little bit. Okay, so got our field evaluated in terms of our, uh, in terms of our parameterization. The next thing is this is this. That's what the integral becomes. So we need to calculate, we already calculated the cross product because we had to orient our, um, maybe, yeah, that's cool. We had to orient our, our surface. And so we know the cross product there. And then we have the, uh, the evaluated version of the field in terms of our parameterization right there. Take the dot product of those things and you get yourself a nice scalar function, negative y squared minus eight plus x. And that's going to be the integrand here. We've already, through this process, we've already related the differentials. That's happened. So we don't have to do anything. We now are just setting up a double integral over the domain of the parameterization. And we let x vary from zero to one, and we let y vary from zero to one minus x if we go back to uh, this slide here. I'm stealing those uh, domains of integration, domain of parameterization as our integration bounds. And then you just calculate it out and we get ourselves an answer of negative 47 over 12. And that brings our uh, chat about surface integrals to an end.